नमस्कार वेल फ्रेंड्स आई हार्डली वेलकम यू ऑल टू भीम भाष्य माय ऑडियो विजुअल पॉडकास्ट सीरीज ऑन डॉक्टर बाबा साहेब अम्बेडकर दिस ऑडियो विजुअल पॉडकास्ट सीरीज हैज 54 शॉर्ट स्पीचेस ऑन डॉक्टर बाबा साहेब अम्बेडकर अनरैवलिंग एज मेनी एज 25 डिफरेंट डायमेंशंस ऑफ हिज multifaceted genius friends this podcast series is all about dr baba saheb ambedkar his thoughts his actions his philosophy and above all the grand vision that he had seen for our nation as a whole that is what this podcast series is all about so let's move on well friends in this episode 52 i'm going to talk about dr ambedkar as a parliamentarian in 1952 when the first time the general election to lok sabha took place he contested the election but regrettably he lost the election he tried to get into lok sabha again in 1954 through a by election but that also failed in the meantime after the defeat in the first ever general elections lok sabha elections he was taken in as a member of parliament in rajya sabha in rajya sabha dr ambedkar always and consistently offered constructive criticism and sage advice on a very wide range of issues by then he had become a rushi he had acquired that status and i'm going to talk about five such interventions of dr ambedkar in the parliament so that would give you a glimpse of his role as a parliamentarian the first one that i want to talk about is uh, when he spoke on constitutional amendments this was uh, on the third amendment bill 1954 and the date was september 15 1954 while speaking on the amendment bill dr ambedkar said and i quote him now what is the basic principle underlying this provision relating to the amendment of the constitution there are two principles which underlie any action relating to the amendment of the constitution the first is that there must be notice to the people the people must know that the government is going to undertake the amendment of the constitution the second principle is that there must be consent of the voters either directly or indirectly by the states by ratifying resolution now sir he said is our government observing these fundamental rules simply because they have obtained a majority they assume that they have not only the power to make any law whatsoever but they have also got the power even without notifying their intention to the people as such to even amend the constitution is the constitution not different in any sense from an ordinary law is it merely a scrap of paper to be amended at whim of anybody he asked then dr ambedkar added and i quote him this is exactly what has been happening and i have been noticing the great contempt or the low regard or respect which the government has for the constitution you may amend the constitution nobody has any objection to amending it but certainly 
you have to treat the constitution on a somewhat different footing, a better footing, a special footing. Tell the people what you are intending to do and then you may do it. Otherwise, he warned, otherwise it might become necessary even to amend the article 368 in such a manner so as to prevent this facile invasion of the constitutional provisions. Unquote. By the way, on another occasion when he was, when the Fourth Amendment Bill 1954 was being discussed in the parliament, the day was March 19, 1955, a member of parliament raised a question. He said, and I quote him, last time when you spoke, you said you would burn the constitution. Dr. Ambedkar retorted to that and I quote him, we built a temple for a god to come in and reside. But before the God could be installed in it, the devil had taken possession of it. What else could we do except to destroy the temple? We do not intend that it should be occupied by the Asuras. That is the reason why I said I would rather like to burn the constitution." Unquote. The second intervention of Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar in Rajya Sabha was on socio-economic issues. While discussing the report of Commissioner for the Scheduled Caste and Tribes for 1953, and the date for this discussion was September 6, 1954, Dr. Ambedkar said, and I quote him, We are all aware of the fact that the scheduled caste in particular are subjected to all sorts of tyrannies operations and maltreatment at the hands of villagers in the midst of whom they live. And it would undoubtedly be a matter of great interest to know what are the tyrannies, maltreatments and operations to which they are being subjected almost every day. I have no doubt that the commissioner's report would be the proper place where such complaints would be recorded. But I find the commissioner absolutely silent on this matter of the gravest importance to the scheduled caste." Unquote. Then Dr. Ambedkar made a bitter attack on Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India. He said, there is one thing which gives me sad thought and it is that our Prime Minister has taken no interest in this matter at all. In fact, he seems to be not only apathetic but anti-untouchable. I happen to have read his biography and I find that he castigated Mr. Gandhi because Mr. Gandhi was prepared to die for the purpose of doing away with separate electorates which was given to the scheduled caste. He had said in, in his biography and he quotes Pandit Nehru, why on the earth Mr. Gandhi is bothering with this trifling problem? Sir, I was shocked and surprised to hear the Prime Minister Mr. Nehru, then in 1934, uttering such words. I thought that since the responsibility of government had fallen on his shoulder, he may have changed his view and thought that he must now take the responsibility which Mr. Gandhi was prepared to take on his shoulder. But I do not find any kind of a change in his mind." Unquote. Dr. Ambedkar then added, Sir, he said, if the Prime Minister is prepared to throw such cold water, not cold water, but water from refrigerator, so to say, what enthusiasm can we expect from the rest of the workers who have taken 
upon themselves the duty or the responsibility or the interest in carrying on with this particular problem unquote on another occasion the subject was untouchability and dr ambedkar was participating in the debate on untouchability offenses bill of 1954 and the date was september 16 1954 and dr ambedkar said and i i quote dr ambedkar he said now sir i find there are certain very grave omissions in the bill and it is to these omissions that i propose to draw the attention of the house there is really as a matter of fact no provision for the removal of any bar against the exercise of civil and constitutional rights no doubt the ultimate result of the bill would be freedom to exercise civil and constitutional rights but i personally think that it would have been much better if my friend had expressly stated that the bill was intended to remove any kind of a bar against the exercise of civil and constitutional rights dr ambedkar went on to say and i quote again i would just like to read him a provision from the civil rights bill as they call it in the united states here dr ambedkar read the provision of the bill in full and said i think such a positive statement was necessary the bill seems to give the appearance that it is a bill of very minor character just a dhobi not washing the clothes just a barber not shaving or just a mithai wala not selling laddus or things of that sort it is not a bill of that sort it is a bill which is intended to give protection with regard to civil and fundamental rights and therefore a positive clause i submit ought to have been introduced in this bill which the bill does not have in its present form that is one omission that i think requires to be made the other omission which i find is of very grave character is that there is no provision against social boycott now i feel from my experience that one of the greatest and the heinous means which the village community applies in order to prevent the scheduled caste from exercising these rights is social boycott they boycott them completely it's a kind of non cooperation and dr ambedkar gave a reference of official committee that was appointed and uh, this was a very important committee and that they included thakkar bappa also as a member of the committee and he read out the conclusion of the committee which said and i quote we do not know of any weapon more effective than this social boycott which could have been invented for suppression of the depressed classes the method of open violence pales away before it for it has the most far reaching and deadening effect then dr ambedkar went on to say that this is the conclusion of a committee which was specifically appointed to consider the conditions of the scheduled caste and here we are i do not find any provision to deal with this point of social boycott the fourth intervention parliamentary intervention by dr baba saheb ambedkar that i have chosen to report here is on center state relations while discussing the relationship between the center which was congress ruled and non congress state governments on september 14 1953 dr ambedkar severely criticized the and i quote him 
intolerant attitude of the former towards the latter. That means the intolerant attitude of the Congress ruled center towards the Congress, non-Congress state governments. He said, the point I was going to place before this house is this. As I said, my honorable friends on the treasury benches are just obsessed by the fact that they must have Congress government in every state. Why is it that our friends are so intolerant about other people having their chance in running the government of their state? It may be that some of them might administer the state in such a way that our Congress friends might have something to learn from them. Why be so dogmatic? Why be so tyrannical? And why manipulate the constitution in this way? You are going to bring the constitution in complete disrepute if you are going to create the impression that all the provisions in the constitutions which we introduce for the purpose of safety are going to be used for the purpose of party politics. Therefore, I am giving you an independent piece of advice that you should use the constitution for the legitimate purpose for which it has been created. Thereby, you will not only create respect for yourself, but will also create respect for the democratic way of life, which is so completely absent in this country. Then we turn to the final intervention, and this is the intervention that I have chosen on Dr. Ambedkar's intervention on foreign policy. While speaking on the international situation, Dr. Ambedkar argued that India's foreign policy was flawed. On August 24, 1954, Dr. Ambedkar said in the upper house, and I quote him, the principles on which the Prime Minister is proceeding, as he has said so himself, are mainly three. One is peace. The second is coexistence between communism and free democracy. And third is opposition to Seattle. Seattle was the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. These are the three main props on which his foreign policy is based. Now, sir, in order that one may be able to assess the validity and adequacy of these principles, it is necessary to be able to assess. Now, the background to my mind is nothing else but the expansion of communism in the world. I am going to start from May 1945 when the war came to an end. That is the Second World War he is talking about. Dr. Ambedkar goes on to add, and I quote, By May 1945, Russia had consumed 10 European states. Now, sir, I was saying that if we take stock of the situation from May 1945 and find out what has happened, this is the situation. Russia has consumed, as I said, 10 European states. One is Finland, two Estonia, three Latvia, four Lithuania, fifth Poland, six Czechoslovakia, seven Hungary, eight Romania, nine Bulgaria, and ten Albania. Well, sir. This is the background. I say against which the adequacy of the principles on which foreign policy of this government is based must be considered. I will first take the principle of peace. We want peace. Nobody wants war. The only question is, what is the price of this peace going to be? 
At what price are we purchasing this peace? Now, it is quite obvious that the peace is being purchased by what might be called partitioning and dismembering of countries. There, what you are doing is this. There are countries which are culturally one, which are socially homogeneous, which have one language, one race, one destiny, desiring to live together. You go there, cut them up and divide the Caracas and hand over a part of the Caracas to what? To countries who are interested in spreading communism. From the figures which I have given, there can be no doubt about it that communist countries today are as big as giant. The Russian liberation, so far as I can understand, is a liberation followed by servitude. It is not liberation followed by freedom. But the point is this, and it worries me considerably. You are, by this kind of peace, doing nothing more but feeding the giant every time the giant opens his jaw and wants something to eat. Now the other question, namely the coexistence. This coexistence, to my mind, is an astounding principle unless it is very strictly limited. The question is, can communism and free democracy work together? Can they live together? Is it possible to hope that there will not be a conflict between them? The theory, at any rate, seems to me utterly absurd. For communism is like a forest fire. It goes on burning and consuming anything and everything that comes in its way. It is clear that the countries which are far distant from the center of communism may feel safe that the forest fire may be extinguished before it reaches them or it may be that the fire may never reach them. But what about the countries which are living in the vicinity of this forest fire? I have seen comments from Canadian statesmen and from European statements congratulating the policy of coexistence. Their praises, their encomiums do not move me in the list. I attach no importance, no value to their view and to their opinion. One must not forget, Dr. Ambedkar warns, one must not forget that in the foreign policy of a country, the geographical factor is one of the most important factors. Each country's foreign policy must vary with its geographical location in relation to the factor with which it is dealing. What is good for Canada may not be good for us. Therefore, this coexistence seems to me a principle which has been adopted without giving much thought on the part of the Prime Minister. The repugnance to Seattle appears to me to arise from two sources. I think that the Prime Minister had certain amount of hostility or if he does not like that word, estrangement between himself and the United States. Somehow, he and the USA do not see eye to eye together. That is one reason why I think he always had a certain amount of repugnance to anything that comes from the United States. And secondly, from the fear of what Russia will think if India joins the CATO. Here again, I think it is necessary to give the House some background against which the merits of CATO may be assessed. The background is this. 
I have already given a list of countries which have gone under the Russian regime. I think it is well known that this happened largely because, if I may say so, of the foolishness of the Americans during the last great war. The Russians got possession of these territories with the consent of Mr. Roosevelt and with the reluctant willingness of Mr. Churchill. Mr. Churchill expressed when the war ended that they had done a great mistake and a great wrong in sacrificing the liberty of so many nations for the sake of winning victory against Hitler. It is to prevent Russia from making further aggression that they are planning the Seattle. The Seattle is not an organization for committing aggression on any country. The Seattle is an organization for the purpose of preventing aggression on free countries. I was going to point the house how this country has been completely encircled on one side by Pakistan and the other Muslim countries. I think there may be a very little difficulty in the Muslim countries joining with Pakistan and forming a block on that side. On this side, by allowing the Chinese to take possession of Lhasa, the Prime Minister has practically helped the Chinese to bring their border down to the Indian border. Looking at all these things, it seems to me that would be an act of levity not to believe that India, if it is not exposed to aggression right now, is exposed to aggression and that aggression might well be committed by people who are always in the habit of committing aggression. Now I come to the other question. What will Russia say if we join Seattle? The key note of our foreign policy is to solve the problem of other countries, not to solve the problems of our own. We have here the problem of Kashmir. We have never succeeded in solving it. Everybody seems to have forgotten that it is a problem. But I suppose someday we may wake up and find that the ghost is there. The Prime Minister has been depending upon what may be called the Panchashil taken by Mr. Mao and recorded in the Tibet Treaty of Non-Aggression. Well, I am somewhat surprised that the Prime Minister should take Panchashil so seriously. The Panchashil, as you know, sir, know it well, is the essential part of the Buddhist religion. And if Mr. Mao had any faith in Panchashil, he would certainly treat the Buddhist in his own country in a very different way. There is no room for Panchashil in politics. And secondly, not in the politics of a communist country. The communist countries have two well-known principles on which they always act. One is that morality is always in a flux. There is no morality. Today's morality is not tomorrow's morality. You can keep your word in accordance with the morality of today and you can break your word with equal justification tomorrow because tomorrow's morality will be different. Therefore, it is better to align ourselves with what we call free nations if we believe in freedom." Unquote. Well, friends, it is evident from these five interventions of Dr. Ambedkar as a parliamentarian clearly shows the depth of his analysis, the range of his uh, understanding and the contribution 
like a sage that he made in the final few years of his glorious life. Friends, we can conclude this session here. So long until we meet again. Thank you. Dhanyavad. Namaskar.